episode 66 of the Intercooler podcast is all about Ferrari. I was thinking about this, Andrew, given that you, you really love that that mark don't you particularly the racing yeah. side of the company we yeah. haven't really i think we've done one episode dedicated to ferrari but that's about it not many yeah and that was a, and that was a while back i think yeah um so this is obviously on the back of the launch of the 296 gtb yeah um which uh was unveiled to the world last thursday um very interesting car uh, lots to be said about that and also i think uh, I think we are going to have a bit of a sort of site techno spot dive into V6 <laughs> and V angles and V everything. And so uh, oh, looking forward to it. All that good stuff. Yeah. So we'll get underway with the 296 GTB, um, a new mid-engine supercar. Now, I know a lot of people will be thinking another one. Um, and it does seem as though <clears throat> out of Marinello, we're, we're getting lots of uh, new derivatives, lots of model updates endlessly. Uh, but this is actually a clean sheet, all new mid-engine supercar. And is it? Is well, it though? Okay, go on. What, what do you propose? Do you, apparently, there's no F8 carryover. Is that right? They say there's no F8 carryover, <laughs> um, but um, they say it's much closer related to the SF90, um, which 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 makes a lot of sense to me. Um, yeah. I think I, th I think that we journalists tend to think <clears> of these things as sort of fairly binary terms that you have a platform and you yeah. spin cars off and then you have another and in fact particularly when you're in low volume particularly when you're dealing with um you know aluminium space frames designs you can just evolve stuff and you can evolve it to a point where it is unrelated to what it began as uh, and so you can say it's a new thing um so i think it is a bit of a a bit of a red herring to say that it's you know it's based on the same platform as as, as anything really but it's certainly much closer related to the sf90 than it is to the to the F8 Tributor, at least according to the Ferrari press conference, which yeah. I, I, I attended virtually um, on Thursday afternoon. Good point. Yeah, a good a point worth making. I suppose we saw something similar with Aston Martin, didn't we? The old VH platform. It actually evolved quite a lot over the, over time, but its origins yeah. were, were back in yeah. Yeah, the, the original van Vanquish, wasn't it? Um, <clears throat> but anyway, we're talking about Ferrari. Uh, so let's run through some of the details of this new 296 GTB, because it is, it is a very interesting car from a technological point of view. Um, it's got a three litre V6 uh, twin turbo. It's a very wide angle V6. We'll come back to that. Um, also a hybrid. It's a plug-in hybrid. Um, the power output is just absolutely astonishing to me. I, I remember, so we, we reported on it last week on Instagram and on the app. Um, and when you sent through your copy, I just thought, well, that has to be a mistake, doesn't it? Eight, <laughs> 819 brake horsepower. Um, from a three litre. From a three litre. I mean, you wrote, didn't you, that Ferrari is clearly in no mood to bow out of the horsepower race. But actually, it's getting, it seems to be growing exponentially, doesn't it? Power out. I mean, I, I, mean I, I, I did look back at it a bit. Uh, and obviously, 818, 819 horsepower is with the hybrid added. But even without the hybrid, <clears throat> There is a three liter engine producing 654 horsepower, which is just nuts, isn't it? And I was looking back over Ferraris, and the only time I can see a similar gain from one generation to the next is when the 599 became the F12. And then I think it went from 620 to 740 horsepower from memory. Mm. So that's about the same because. Um, you know, if you think that an F8 Tributo has what 710, and this has got 890, so 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 it's about the same sort of mm. it's about the same sort of leap. Um, but yeah, they're not giving up, are they? Yes, <clears throat> it's staggering. And people like us have been saying for so long they're too powerful now, they're too, and they're getting more and more and more powerful. It's extraordinary. Mm. Um, mm. This one is rear wheel drive only, so all that power through a pair of boots. Um, 15 mile electric only range, and it'll do 80 something miles an hour electric only. I think that's pretty clever, actually. Um, you wrote something recently on, on the app and on the Instagram site about downforce uh, and, and road cars, effectively saying, don't buy into all those figures that are quoted, but I'm gonna quote some to you anyway. 360 kilograms of downforce at 155 miles an hour okay. with the Assetto Fiorano pack. Um, yeah. So, that's a substantial amount, but it's not it's not full hypercar territory, is it really, which is to be expected. No, it's, and, and at that speed, um, you know, if you extrapolate backwards, that's probably not enough to require 
a spring rate that's going to ruin your ride. That's the key thing, isn't it? They haven't, yeah. gone, they haven't ramped up the downforce so much that they no. have to give it all that support with solid springs. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, okay, dry weight with lightweight options, 1,470 yes. kilograms. Uh, so without the lightweight options at the curb, you're looking at 1,600 plus, um, which is sort of reasonable for a, a hybrid with a, a decent sized battery. <laughs> It is, it is, it is, it is for a hybrid. You see, you've already qualified it, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So it, what, okay, what interests me is, you know, so that's 40. So all these weights I'm going to talk about are, I call them cheat weights because they're not enough in a spec that anyone's ever going to drive a car. But, you know, it's not just Ferrari who quote dry weights. Now McLaren do it too. And I think some others as well. So, you know, it, it's all comparable. So an SF90 is 1570 dry with all the lightweight options, okay? Remove the front axle drive, make the V8 a V6, and call it a 296 GTB, and, that, and you save 100 kilos there, which is 100 kilograms. I mean, that's a lot of weight. Mm. But even so, despite having a V6 rather than a V8, the car is still, I'm just trying to remember now, 130 kilograms heavier than an F8 Tributo. Yeah. 140, I think. I, th I think an F8 Tributo is 1330 dry. So, you know, you're still adding 10%, mm. you know. And the, and the other thing, okay, uh, the other little calculation I did was, you know, take a McLaren 720S, which is quite an old car now, and put that into full lightweight trim, okay? That comes in at under 1,300 dry. Yeah, 1,293, I think, okay? Compared to 1,470 for the 296 GTB. Okay, now, if you look at the specs, you'll see that the McLaren has 710 horsepower and then the, and the Ferrari has 819. So they seem to be really quite a distance apart. But the moment you actually produce a power to weight yeah. ratio, it's like this. Yeah. There's nothing between them. Mm. And what would you rather have? A lightweight car with a bit less power or a heavyweight car with quite a lot more power? Um, and I think that you and I, probably a lot of people listening to this would, you know, would go down one road. And I suspect that the sort of person who's going to be interested in you know, telling people how much power their car's got, um, we'll go down another. So it's it's interesting, isn't it? You can't look at these things in isolation. It's not just how much power they've got, it's how much weight that power has to tow to. Mm. That's the only way that will give you a full, proper understanding of the way this car is likely to perform. Um, we can only speculate at the moment, but what do you think a 296 GTB engine would be like without the hybrid drive, given it's producing more than 200 um, horsepower per litre? It's so oh, heavily okay. turbocharged. That's the thing, okay? That's where the hybrid is actually, I'm gonna spring <laughs> to the defense of the hybrid because you think to yourself, wow, I mean, you know, you know, how light would it be without all that? <laughs> it would still have 654 horsepower um, in a much lighter car. That's just gonna be a better car, isn't it? However, yeah. the reason the internal combustion engine can develop that kind of power is because you've got the hybrid filling all the gaps because mm. otherwise without, the hybrid torque to fill, you know, if you're going to have a normally, sorry, if you're going to have a turbocharged engine producing 650 horsepower for three liters, it's going to be peaky. And this yeah. thing rests to eight and a half thousand reps, which means it's going to be pretty unresponsive off boost, um, which would be horrible, except it's not because you just get the hybrid to do that for you. Yeah. And that's where it's clever. That's why you can get, that's why you can actually get these huge jumps in power mm. because what you're losing by doing it, you're putting back with the hybrid at the bottom end. So, you know, so, uh, you know, I, I have seen someone saying, oh, just get rid, get rid of the hybrid. It's, it's not that simple because mm. the car would probably mm. be horrible to drive. That's right. Yeah, it's worth pointing out, isn't it? Yeah. All these dry weights, they do make me laugh. Man, lots of manufacturers do it now. And yeah. just as a rule of thumb, you and I tend to add about 100 kilograms. Actually, it, it might have to be a little bit more than that, maybe 120 kilograms. Well, that's, that's 100 kilograms to get from dry to curb. Yeah. But to get from dry and then with all the lightweight options fitted. So, you know, and they can be really, really lightweight. So, so, you know, it might be ceramic brakes. It might be, you know, carbon wheels. Yeah. yeah? There are all sorts of things, you know, carbon, bits of carbon body weight. You know, you can take, I mean, I think the uh, set of Fiorano pack on an SF90 is about 90 kilograms light. Yeah, it takes about 90, 90 kilograms. So, you know, if, so, you know, uh, that's like 200 kilograms there from dry to curb and from a set of you know so you know <clears throat> if you've got 
the weight of an Assetto Fiorano SF90 with all lightweight op options, dry, is probably 200 kilograms less yeah. than the weight of an SF90 just parked in a showroom with nothing on it. Mm. Yeah, it's, it is extraordinary. And manufacturers will keep on quoting figures this way. And all we can do is keep on highlighting what actually the, the real world curb weight is likely to be. Um, yes, and as long as as long as manufacturers are consistently <clears throat> unrealistic in the way that they yeah. quote their figures, the figures remain comparable. So you know, kind of that's kind of fine, isn't it? Yeah, it is kind of fine. What cracks me up is when manufacturers quote a power to weight ratio using the dry figure, um, because actually a car with no fluids or, or fuel <laughs> doesn't produce any power at all. <laughs> so it's naught horsepower per ton, isn't it? Um, yes. Okay, so a little bit more on the 296 GTB. Why 296? Have you got your head around that yet? Yes, I've got it because they can't, they can't name it after <laughs> an old Peugeot. Yeah, so it should be 306. It should be 306. Um, and some people have said, oh, yes, that's because, like, you know, with the, you know, the 911 when it came out was a 901, mm. and then Peugeot forced them to make it a 911. Now, you know, in Ferrari nomenclature, um, that hasn't been the case because obviously they had a 208 and a 308 in the past. Mm. Um, but the point being was that the 208 and the 308 Ferraris came before the 208 and the 308 Peugeots. So they weren't naming it after a Peugeot. Mm. Ferrari <laughs> 306. It just doesn't have the ring to it. So although the, the engine displaces 2992 cc, so it's absolutely close to 3 liters to mm. 2.9, they have decided for the sake <laughs> of naming. Also, there was a 296S race car. Mm, so it's um whereas there's never been a 306 race car um so it's it's a much more ferrari uh title and given that you know everybody plays fast and loose with their naming things these days you know mm, yeah. you know mercedes with their 63s and their 43s and their 50 and everything else you know it's fine it's fine it doesn't trouble me at all yeah yeah it's not really that important is it no. um so there will be a 296 gtb assetto fiorano it's just an upgrade package really but there's some quite cool stuff in there. You, you get multi-matic shock absorbers, um, presumably race style um, suspension. That's pretty cool. Um, more aero kit, uh, a Lexan rear screen to save weight, uh, a bit more carbon fiber. Uh, you can also have, um, there was something else. No, maybe there was, oh no, you can have those cup to R tires that we're, yeah. we've spoken about before, haven't we? And so when, when they quote a lap time, around Fiorano that's the same as an F12 TDF and half a second faster than a Pista. Uh, I mean, that, that is staggeringly quick. Uh, a huge amount of that will be in those super sticky tires. Um, okay, we reckon about 230,000 pounds to drive, to, to buy, excuse me. Uh, and very clear nod, isn't there, in terms of styling to the 250 LM. Um, yeah, particularly rear with the rear wheel arches. Yeah, rear yeah. arches with the air intakes on top. Yeah. What do you think of the way the car looks generally? I like it. Mm. I like it. Um, it's, I don't think people have said, oh, it's, you know, it's the best looking Ferrari since the 458. Um, I, th I think I'd go along with that because I don't think it's as good looking as a 458. When I remember the 458 came out, I just looked, wow. Mm. Um, whereas with this one, I'm going, yeah, that's nice. Mm. But I'm not getting that sort of gut emotional response to it. I'm not looking at, looking at it and thinking, that is gorgeous. I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, that's a really polished, well-executed job. They've done a nice job with that. Mm. Um, so I think it, I think it looks good. Um, but I'm not, you know, I'm not sort of um, getting that deep emotional reaction to it. Ferrari did say, didn't they, when the Monzas were new, those screenless cars, uh, yeah. the one and the two-seater versions, that that more classically beautiful, restrained, sort of curvaceous design would influence the, the forthcoming Ferrari production cars. And it has done. The Roma yeah. is true to that. The yeah. F90 and now there's 296. They're, they're simpler, they're cleaner, they're purer. But you can compare it to an F8, which is very angular, very busy design. Um, I think I prefer the way that, they've, that they're going now, to be honest. Yeah, um, I don't know. No, you mean, I mean, the F8 is obviously the ultimate evolution of the 458 design. Right. And I think a lot of the original beauty of the 458 was lost with the 488 and then with with the f8 and i think that you're now at a point where mm. although i don't prefer the 296 gtb to the 458 i think i do prefer it to the f8 yeah yeah because they they got so busy with i mean that that car has been around for 12 years or something and they got so busy yeah, with the design over over the years didn't they yeah um okay before we go any further i just want to talk yeah. about the intercooler app briefly um and this is very on topic because 
<laughs> just uh, today as we're recording this, Peter Robinson has written an article for the app all about getting banned from Ferrari for life, twice. Um, we twice. Think, we think he's the only person to, to hold that distinction. Um, so it's just a fun story about what happens, particularly back in the, the 70s, the 80s, 90s, what happens as a journalist when you go to Fiorano to test a car and you give an honest opinion to your audience? What ha how, how does for, do Ferrari or did Ferrari back then take it with good grace, good humor, or not? <laughs> uh, <laughs> not is probably the, the answer there. I, I, um, I, yeah, I, I, think it, I think it is very much um, a sort of tale of its times, isn't it? Um, and I, th I think the other thing I would say, although Peter was banned for life twice, um, by the time he finally left living in Italy, where he had lived, for, um, you know, he was on fantastic, fantastically good terms with them. And him and Luca de Monster, you know, yeah, Peter is far too modest to say that they were good friends, but they were. Um, so yeah. although, you know, not, not only was he banned for life twice, he was let back in twice as well. So... <laughs> um it's just it's just it's just a great story and, and, and he's always peter's been a bit sort of reticent about telling it because i think i don't think peter is particularly the sort of person who likes sort of doing these sort of self-indulgent there i was type pieces uh i love doing them um but peter is you know he 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 he, he regards himself as a sort of industry reporter um but i'm just really really pleased that we managed to persuade him to do it because it you know it is it's a really really good read uh, and it's and it's really it provides a proper insight into the way that things you know used to be um, with that particular bit of the motor industry you know way back when yeah that's right back then it, it was the case that if you said something critical about their cars the people at ferrari would be hurt by that they would yeah. take it as a personal insult it's extraordinary um, somebody somebody did once say to me and again this was a long time ago and nobody is anywhere near the company now but somebody did once turn around to me and say andrew i thought we were friends yeah <laughs> <laughs> wow it's remarkable yes. isn't it Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Elsewhere on the app over the last few days, I've driven the Aston Martin Vantage F1 edition. That's the safety car one. Um, it's also the Vantage. I think that the Vantage should have been all along. It's it's fantastic. Um, elsewhere, we've written about our first cars. So nine or ten of us wrote about our first cars. There's some good stories in there. Joe, our, our engineer, Joanna Fidalgo, has been writing about the '90s. She reckons that was the a golden era for the automobile and she makes a good, a good case. Andrew, you wrote a really cool piece about, it's effectively the typical maiden race weekend. And anyone who has raced will remember their first weekend and read that article and go, yep, 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 did that. <laughs> yeah, that uh, I, yeah, I remember that uh, because yeah. I think it's such an intimidating thing, isn't it? It's a horrifying experience. It, it is awful. And in that moment when you're on the grid for the first time, you would do anything to be anywhere else. Anywhere else. Yeah. But and yet the instant, the instant the, the lights go out. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an extraordinary thing. It's, 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 it's a, it, I mean, not that I, not that I wrote this, but I've always regarded it as a very interesting insight into the way that the human brain hmm. works, how you can, despite you knowing exactly what's going to happen, how your emotions can swing so totally mm. in such a short period of time from absolute fear, dread and loathing to total euphoria mm. when nothing surprising has happened, mm. when what has happened is exactly what you expected <laughs> to happen all along. Um, and yet suddenly, yeah, and, and you sort of wonder whether you kind of even know yourself because yeah. the person that you feel you are one minute after the race has started doesn't recognise the person you were two minutes ago. The the, 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 the the terrified, yeah. uh, timid, cowardly person quaking in the car, waiting for the lights to go, you know. Um, and I've always been fascinated by that. And because although I've done, you know, I've done a number of hundreds of races now, I still get it a bit. Yeah. yeah. I've never lined up on <clears throat> Sometimes if it's, if you're doing a long distance race and, you know, and it's the middle of the race and someone comes down the pit lane, you get in the car and off you go, that's fine. But there is something uniquely terrifying about the start of a motor race. Um, when you're all there together and no one's moving and the revs are rising and you don't know what's going to happen and you're just hoping you get through the first corner in one piece there is it's certainly in everything that i do there is you know there is nothing more i suppose focusing um than that and and once it goes well nothing more brilliant but um 
yeah anyway take a look um i enjoyed writing it and um hopefully if you have raced uh it will resonate with you and if you haven't i don't know whether it will persuade you to go and race or not it'll it'll certainly push you one way or the other yeah 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 it's it's a brilliant piece go and read it so download the intercooler app just search the intercooler in whichever app store you use you'll find it uh start your free trial you've got a one month free trial um and see what you think we think you'll like it uh Okay, enough app stuff. Let's get back to Ferrari. Now, wh- one of the interesting things is that Ferrari has made it quite clear and it's, m- it's intentionally moved to make it as clear as it can that the, the 296 is not replacing the F8, the V8 range, um, which seems a slightly odd thing to say. So the, the F8 will carry on for a little while, apparently. We don't know how long for. What do you think is going on here? Are they fulfilling orders and they don't want the f8 to seem like an old car or are they actually going to coexist i, well, I mean don't forget let's not forget the f8 is the facelift of the facelift isn't it um and ferrari's never done that before so um my guess is that the f8 was created to fill the gap between what would have been the natural end of that line of car and the arrival of the hybrid um, and I don't know, you know, Ferrari is adamant that it is entirely additional too. But then again, if you had a load of F8s, you still need to sell. That's what you would say, isn't it? Um, so my, my guess is that the F8 um, in both Tributo and Spider form will be around for a bit. It's interesting, isn't it, that they haven't done a Pista. Mm-hmm. You know, it's the first of those cars, you know, from way back at the 360. Yeah. You know, they've always done a special one and they haven't with the F8. And I think I read a bit into that and, uh, you know, what it's likely longevity is. Um, so, and also, you know, if you just look at the way the world is going, um, you know, you're going to have to have a hybrid fairly shortly. So, you know, a year or two, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't back it beyond that. Could I just talk SF90 for a second? Mm. It is directly relevant to, to this conversation. When I drove the SF90 and however, impressed I was by its power and its poise and and, and, it, and it is in very many ways an extremely impressive car what I thought at the time and indeed what I wrote at the time was how much better it would be if it didn't have a driven front axle so it was lighter and cheaper um, and also had a boot which allowed you to actually go somewhere in it because That's an cool. SF90 just doesn't um, and so now we have the 296 GTB which is literally which is that car you know it doesn't have a driven front axle it is lighter it does have a boot you will be able to go places in it and yet both cars will have a level of performance you can't use on a public road and once you factor in the additional weight of the sf90 their power to weight ratios of the sf90 and the 296 gtb they i mean they're still a distance apart there's like 60 70 horsepower apart but you know they're not absolutely worlds apart um and you can buy a 296 GTB for, we think, £230,000, basic. I think an SF90 is £375,000. So what are you actually buying if you spend another £140,000, £150,000 on an SF90? You're buying a car which in the real world isn't going to be any quicker. But you're going to be buying a car which is heavier and which is far, far, far less usable because you can't go on holiday in it. You can't go away in it. And I just wonder what that car's for now. I don't know. I mean, I haven't driven a 296 GTB, so, you know, I'm going to have to reserve judgment. But, you know, to me, if I was looking at, you know, oh, of course, okay, who's it for? It's for people who like telling people they drive a car with a thousand horsepower. <laughs> and if you and if you want a thousand horsepower, it's still cheap. Yeah. You know, because, you know, if you want to buy a thousand horsepower, you've got to go, you know, you've got to go and buy something utterly ridiculous, um, costing millions. So, you know, for the sort of, you know, for the sort of the armchair enthusiasts and, you know, and, and, and the barroom jockeys who like, you know, who, who define the brilliance of their car by the amount of power its engine can provide, then I guess it has a point. But to anybody who actually is interested in driving and using their cars, you know, bear in mind, too, the SF90 is not a limited production car. No. So it's not a collector's car. Um, it's not like a LaFerrari or something, which has a whole other reason for people wanting to buy it. Um, I, I, I struggle. I really do. I'm not, I'm not dissing the car because it does remarkable things. But, mm. you know, just on paper, looking at the 296 GTB, I mean, I haven't seen a better reason for someone not to buy an SF90. <laughs> and save a lot of money. It's an interesting point. 
I suppose for decades, manufacturers like Ferrari, they had a very clear model hierarchy and they knew where each car sat and what each one was for. Yeah. But nowadays, as horsepower figures because of hybrid drive, as they rock it, the, the hierarchies are becoming a bit jumbled up and certain models are treading on the toes of other ones. It'll be interesting to see how it plays out, but they do need to be very careful not to you know, not to shoot themselves in the foot by giving their, their more affordable models too much power. Yeah, we'll see what happens there. Um, okay, so you've spoken about the SF90. We said we'd talk about the rest of Ferrari's model range and just sort of a bit of a state of the nation address on where its, it's lineup is at at the moment. So at the top, um, we've got the 812 and we know there's the new competitor, the only model coming. 812 is the sensational car. The, the yeah. drop top GTS is, it's the only one I've driven, but wow yeah yeah it's wonderful yeah um, it's a great thing it's a great thing and it, exactly what a v12 a v ferrari should be uh elsewhere we've got the roma and the portofino m um i've driven the portofino m recently you've driven the roma yeah uh, i think i think you liked the the coupe didn't you i did i really like the roma yeah i you know i think it's a it's a fantastically well judged car um you know this is ferrari doing sensible practical yet still visceral and emotional um and uh, i mean th there are really few boxes that car doesn't tick because it's quiet and it's comfortable and it's a great gt but it's also handles very well it's beautifully balanced um uh, it's got a great interior and um it's stunning i just love the look of the thing mm. i think the roma is a fantastic looking car agreed yeah, yeah the the portofino m i drove it recently and it's a it's a big improvement particularly over the Californias, it's so much better to drive than a California yeah. T as a sporting car. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's not the one I would choose. It's still pretty compromised by having, um, it's 100 kilograms heavier than the Roma with which it shares a powertrain and, and a platform. Um, and you feel it, it is there. Yeah. Actually, the, what really struck me is when you, particularly when you're stationary and you raise and lower the roof, as it comes down and drops onto the header rail, it lands with a thump and it rattles the car. And when it goes back into the boot, again, it lands with a thump and the whole car goes doo -doo -doo, and you think, yeah. crikey, that's a lot of weight moving around there. Yeah, yeah. Um, Even so, it's, it's much better to drive than earlier versions. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, I, I haven't driven the M, but, but the M, but I actually thought I was, I was, I was very pleasantly surprised by, mm. um, by just the standard Portofino when I drove that. Yeah, yeah, you can you can hoof it along a road, and it's pretty yeah. good. It, it doesn't feel as compromised as as earlier versions. Um, so yeah, fine, great, and it serves a purpose that car. Um, so that's the the model lineup as it is at the moment. But we know there's much more coming. Yeah, controversially, uh, next year we'll see what we're currently calling the Puro Sang, which is Ferrari's first SUV. Yeah. Yeah, that's a slightly um, troubling thought, isn't it? I mean, there's that, and um, yeah, and also we should mention also the electric car that's going to come after that. Um, uh, and what I'm trying to do now is get through these cars quite quickly because I'm trying to engineer in a bit of time to talk about V6 angles. <laughs> um, I mean, I, th I think the I think the point with these cars are, you know, Ferrari is now a publicly owned company. Yeah. Um, as of so, 2015. As of 2015. Um, or a lot of it is a publicly owned company. So they are now accountable to shareholders. Um, whereas in the past, they were accountable, well, to Fiat, and to the Agnelli family, and to themselves, um, which meant they could do pretty much what they wanted. But now, you know, they have to provide shareholder value. And how do you provide shareholder value? You sell, you provide shareholder value by making more cars and selling them for more money you become a more profitable business and that's how you satisfy your shareholders you know what i find um, you know when i was growing up and, and maybe actually even when you um were born and uh you know there were there were three ferraris you know there was a um there was a little one. it was either a dino or a 308 and then there was a luxury one so it was a you know a 400 or a 456 um and there was a fast one, which was a Testa Rossa or a 550 Marinello, whatever. And that was it. Three cars. Look at it now. Mm. Mm. Um, and, you know, and I understand absolutely the reason for doing it, because it wouldn't be a very good public company if it didn't provide, it wouldn't be a very successful public company, you know, um, if it didn't provide 
value to its shareholders. And, and although the IPO did have quite a rocky start, um, you know, Ferrari has done extremely well um, on the back of this um, philosophy ever since. But it does make it a very different company. You know, it is not the company of Luca de Montezemolo anymore, mm. um, which was very pure and very focused on producing cars that were absolutely the embodiment of what people thought yeah. the Ferrari brand should represent, which is not an SUV and it's not an electric car. Um, but, you know, the world's a different place and Ferrari's a different company. Yeah, that's right. Look at the Monta Zambello was like the guardian of the old Ferrari values. Um, yeah. and, and now we're in a different age. That's right. It's a yeah. different world. It's the public company now. And it actually exists for a slightly different purpose. Okay, fine. Let, but let's talk about V6s. Yay! <laughs> let's do it. If you're watching this on YouTube in particular, we'll do the hand gestures for you. So we'll do a narrow <laughs> angle V6. We'll do a 90 degree V6 and a 120 degree V6, which is getting towards a flat, almost boxer engine. So we know the, the, the new 296 GTB has got a 120 degree V8. So very V6, excuse me. So a very wide open one. Yeah, um, and that's it's an unusual configuration, but we're seeing it a bit more these days. Well, it's a, in road cars. It's a pretty much an unheard of configuration, and then suddenly, three have turned up all at once. Um, so the McLaren Artura, the new V6 in that, is a 120 degree V6. The Aston Martin V6 engine, which has now been canned but was going to power pretty much everything going forward for them. Uh, that was a 120 degree V6. And now this new Ferrari engine is a 120 degree, 120 <laughs> degree V6. So the question is why? Okay, so the 120 degree V6 has several advantages. Because opposing pistons can share the same crank pins, what you have is a very short, very stiff, very compact engine. Um, you can, it also can rev higher than a conventional 60 degree V6. Um, and so you can get more power out of it. So why weren't they all like that? Well, the problem is most V6 engines, uh, in road cars have gone in the nose. And the problem is once you have an engine that is that wide, it gets in the way of your suspension and it ruins your steering lock. So it only really works in a mid engine car. Fine. But why hasn't it been in mid-engine cars? Because until now, mid-engine cars have been exotic things, which have V8s and V10s and V12s in them. So yep. there's been no place for these engines. But now in the age of downsizing, where you have the need for a, a small engine, but it can still go behind you, it suddenly makes sense in a way that it never did. Because, you know, not only is it shorter and stiffer and stronger and everything else and is able to develop more power there's space between the v to put your turbos which means you get that optimal hot v configuration which means your turbos um get going and uh it's great for for power and for emissions um it lowers the center of gravity too because it's obviously it's a much lower engine i mean it's just a, it's just a win-win-win all the way through um which is why we are seeing them today so my question to you is how many other V6 configurations have there been? Yeah. Uh, That's a really Ferrari unfair question. Or, or generally? Any, uh, any okay, okay. okay, so what's the narrowest one you can think of? Um, well, there are some that, they're so narrow, aren't they? They Like a VR6. Yes, like exactly, the, the, the VR6. Yes. And they basically share a head, don't they? Yeah, they, 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 sit, they sit on the same head. So I think they were between like sort of 10 and 15 degrees. Mm. Um, and of course, it still exists under the bonnet of a Bentley, which is, you know, the W12 Bentley engine is effectively two VR6s mm. um, sitting on a common crank. Um, normal V6s are 60 degrees. Um, but, well, we'll come back to the 65 degree V6 in a minute. Uh, <laughs> oh my God, we're going deep. Um, <laughs> So, uh, and then there are some weird ones. I assume you did a 75 degree V6. Uh, I think GM did a 54 degree V6. Uh, and the, uh, the wonderful McLaren MP44, um, which had that uh, incredible Honda V6 in it, which won 15 races at 16 attempts, had an 80 degree V6. Um, but previous Ferrari V6s have had 65 degree V6s um, angles in them. Um, and they did that because they wanted to 
um, get a bit more space between the feed to, for bigger carburetors um, and that sort of thing. However, and this is what I want to talk about, yeah. um, the 120 degree V6 that Ferrari produces today is not their first 120 degree, degree V6 because 60 years ago, they had just such an engine in the back of their Formula One car. Um, and the reason for that is exactly the same reason it's in the back of the 296 GTB today, because Ferrari only went to a mid-engine design in 1961, whereas everybody else, all the Coopers on the Lotus had done it at the back end of the 50s. And it was only then, once they decided finally that they were going to um, put the engine behind the driver, that they could go to this optimum configuration. And they actually, in 1961, ran three cars with 120 degree V6s in them and one with 65 degrees. And the 120 degree cars were just faster and better. And um, and they absolutely romped to the championship. I think they did seven rounds and they won all but two of them. And the only two they didn't win were at Monaco and the Nürburgring, which were handling circuits and Sterling won both of them because he was Sterling. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so that's the sort of history of the 120 degree V6 in Ferraris. Um, and yeah, it's great. They're going to be doing another. I've never driven a six-cylinder Ferrari, but then... Oh, you not, should. Not too many people have. So what, what are my options? Dino. Is it a Ferrari? Yes, of course it is. <laughs> in what way, I mean, it's, 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 you know, to call it anything other than a Ferrari is, is to indulge in sort of badge engineering. Yeah, it's a Ferrari. Yeah, yeah. No, you're right. Um, Fine. Uh, okay, no, so, so there, there, there were... Um, Ferrari did do some straight sixes um, mm. in racing cars. Um, but in terms of V6s in road cars, uh, there was the 206, which I think came out in 1967. Um, and then there was the 246, which came out in 1969. Um, and that's it. And it's a fantastic engine. It's a wonderful engine. It, it, it sounds like an angry V12. It sounds like a sort of rough and ready mm. coarse V12. Um, and it's all mechanical because it's got chain driven camshafts and it is derived from um the v6 engine which mike hawthorne won the 1958 formula one world championship in that was also a 65 degree v6 um so it's a proper engine with you know proper heritage it sounds wonderful um and yeah if you ever get a chance to go and have a quick run up the road in a, in a decent dino do it yeah great no i no, i will um so that's that well, there you go we told you we'd go deep on six and the Ferraris. Sorry, sorry. I've, <laughs> I've just been, you know, ever since Ferrari made this announcement last week, I've just been, uh, I've just been sort of living these engines. So I just, I just felt the need to get it off my chest because I knew that you guys, um, if nobody else would kind of <laughs> indulge me and bear with me and say thank you. It is interesting, isn't it? That based on the V angle, engines have different characteristics, different qualities. Um, yeah, I find that stuff really interesting. Has anyone ever done a completely flat six? Yes, but Porsche. That, yeah, but that is still a V, technically a V. Uh, I did. Uh, is the Porsche engine a boxer? Yes. Well, they call it one, don't they? Can I should know this. It's appalling. <laughs> it's appalling. I, I really should know the answer to this. But because that's where Boxster came from, didn't it? Boxer Roadster. It's a portmanteau of those two words. So no, they, okay. They, yeah, but, but, but yeah, but Ferrari called their flat twelve. Yeah car a boxer and that's yeah. definitely not a boxer yeah. so just because you call it a boxer doesn't make it a boxer um that's appalling knowledge on my part uh, there'll be people who yeah uh, yeah uh, I, mm. so there we go if you do know the answer to that has there ever been what we're we asking has there ever been a 180 degree v6 well how many yellow flat sixes have there been subaru Subarus. tucker right <laughs> i'll take your word for that the tucker torpedo Tucker's know, another whole know. great Tucker's a great story. It's how okay. Tucker was there was a bloke called Tucker, funnily enough, who created this incredible car in America in the late 40s, early 50s. Um, and basically the big three didn't like it. And so they just stuffed him. They absolutely stuffed him. There's a great film. I presume it's just called Tucker. I can't remember. It's got stars Jeff Bridges as this bloke, and it tells the whole story of what happened really really and it had a and it had a rear engine flat six in it what about the um chevy corvette that had a flat six in it too didn't it we're gonna have to do a little bit of reading up on this aren't we and report back next week yeah a bit of flat sixery yeah good stuff right okay we'll leave that one there lots of ferrari chat we won't leave it so long next time that was good 
Um, no. So there we go. We've already told you about the app over the last week or so. Just go and download it. Go and download it. Start your one month free trial um, and let us know what you think. We think you'll like it. Uh, and as ever, we'll be back to talk to you again next week. Look forward to it. Thanks all.